Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tabor Swatsky with Gopher Sport, and I'd like to welcome all of you to today's Gopher Solutions webinar. For those of you who are new to our webinar series, this is a monthly webinar focusing on a variety of physical education subjects and topics. Past webinar topics have included PE teachers presenting on specific activities like assessment, fitness, and classroom management. Past presenters have included Dr. Robert Pangrazy, Dr. John Medina, and Jean Blades. Our presenters have done a great job of bringing useful topics and information to the field of physical education. Our webinars will almost always occur the third week of the month, and all attendees of today's webinar will receive a certificate of participation for one hour of educational credit. Also today, all attendees will be entered to win a soft text rainbow set of soccer balls and the Class Plus Disc Pack, valued at over $430. Both of these items are great for small-sided games, which is our topic for today. Today's webinar is titled Enhance PE Participation with Small-Sided Games with Jessica Shawley. Before I introduce Jessica, I wanted to mention that you will have the chance to ask questions during the presentation. Your questions are only visible to me, the moderator, so feel free to ask any questions you might have during the presentation. Questions can be typed in the questions area on the right side of your screen at any time during the webinar. We'll accumulate questions throughout the presentation and we'll have a chance to address your questions with Jessica at the end of the presentation. And today I have the pleasure of introducing our presenter, Jessica Shawley. Jessica is a national NASPE Middle School Physical Education Teacher of the Year. She is national board certified along with a master's degree in curriculum and instruction. Her high-energy workshops are jam-packed with ideas and resources that support and inspire professionals on a variety of topics, including small-sided games, pedometers, blending fitness and nutrition into activity, integrating choice, grant writing, and professional practices. Teaching at Moscow Middle School in Moscow, Idaho since 2003, the core of Jessica's teaching is built upon emphasizing personal and social responsibility, providing student choice and meaningful content, and teaching a variety of activities that have a viable connection to students' lives. She strives to build a sense of value regarding physical activity, all while trying to have the most fun possible. Jessica played fast pitch softball at Whitworth University, where she earned her BA in health and fitness education, an endorsement in secondary math education, and a leadership studies minor. Jessica is uh, just left her one class. She's going to wedge in this webinar here between her next class. And so at this time, I will turn it over to Jessica. It's all yours. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, Jaber, and thank you for such a kind introduction, and thank you to Gopher for the opportunity to be here with everyone today, and thanks to everyone for listening in. So, you know, I'll just, I'll get right to it. I am so excited to be here. It's a favorite topic of mine. Uh, Small-sided games is just a fantastic thing for a physical education program. So what's fun about today's webinar for me is I kind of get to be the PE DJ here, just kind of playing and sharing my favorite hits and highlights for what's working in my program and, and for me as a teacher. So really today's topic is also an extension of a blog that I wrote last year that was titled Five Ways Small-Sided Games Make a Big Impact. And so I really get to expand upon that with you today. And so I want everyone listening in just to, you know, take it all in, you know, take what's here today and then build upon it, make it your own, enhance it, and um, really have it impact your current program. Before we get going, I just wanted to let everyone know my context, my context and where I'm, I'm teaching at, so that you understand I'm a middle school physical education teacher, and we are, we call our students CHAMPS, our program CHAMPS, we're creating healthy active minds for personal success. It's a team teaching system. I have two other coworkers, and we share our students' common assessments, student reflections, portfolios with some goal setting journals, other activities, our fitness gram, and we really emphasize community access information where they can do things in the community. And so each week, the students rotate through the teachers in the different variety of units. And then we use the FitStep Pro pedometers daily, and they download them, and this is year-round. We focus on achievable MVPA and physical activity time goals when we're working within our activities, and this especially comes into play through small-sided gameplay with providing us data and feedback, and it allows us to, you know, assess our students and assess our own lessons and our teaching, and it helps motivate the students. 
And our foundation is really on a variety. We have physical activity themes and lifelong fitness. You know, FLASH is kind of an acronym there for us with fitness, lifetime activities, sports, and health. So our goals, why are we really here? And if you've ever heard of it, it's the Golden Circle by Simon Sinek, and it's the what, the how, and the why. Like, why are we here? What's the purpose? And really, the use of small-sided games has given my program the biggest bang for, bang for a buck, you could say, in terms of max, maximizing participation, inclusion, skill development, and assessment opportunities, while also keeping the learning enjoyment uh, environment really enjoyable. So with that in mind, our goal today is really overall the what, learn really how to use small-sided games in physical education. And maybe, you know, it's always good to come away with new activities and games. And then, you know, diving in deeper is hopefully you'll be able to identify how to modify traditionally organized activities and really capitalize on the learning opportunities that they create and provide in your program. And that really that inner circle, that really that most important one that we're always thinking of and all that we do and all we're planning is really what's your why? Why are you doing this? And, you know, you're here right now in a webinar, you're learning, and that reflective teaching from a growth. We're always looking for new ways and enhancing current ways to achieve student learning outcomes, and we want to learn how to utilize those best practices in physical education. So those are kind of the things that I wanted to keep in mind today in designing this webinar for everyone. Another thing, and I did a choice webinar last year, is there's these so three big factors. Uh, students having autonomy, mastery, and purpose. It really leads to motivation. It enhances their, their performance. And so when we're thinking about small-sided games within this context, small-sided games allow them to have more choice in, in the decision-making process and therefore that autonomy and that control. Their mastery is going to really be um, heightened. They're going to be able to use and improve their skills. They're going to get more reps. And then their purpose, their sense of purpose as multi-sided games, they have more value. They're on a smaller team. They're getting more interaction. They feel like they're making more of a difference. So those things, those, that Venn diagram there, there's going to be a higher level of engagement um, using small-sided games as a best practice in your program. Another thing, and, and before I get into all this, you. I don't want you to have to read all these bullet points. All this information, I'm going to have it on my website for you to be able to utilize and access all the resources, all the handouts and everything. So it's going to be there. But I just wanted to show you in my webinar slides, which will also be available, that these things do align with our appropriate practices from our national organization. So the inclusion, the cooperation, the competition, maximizing participation, it's all there specifically self-responsibility, success races are increased, your ability to provide teacher feedback and assessment. So it was really neat to kind of align and reference things and support things and show you, the listener, how small-sided games do help our planning and help meet our standards as well. And I gave you some examples here just from the grade level outcomes, the new ones that are out from Shape America. I have six, seventh, and eighth graders, so I just pulled one strand from each just as a simple example of how it really does align with all five of our national standards. You know, it's the invasion and field game stuff. They're using tactics and shots in the net wall games. We're increasing their fitness. We're really emphasizing personal and responsibility in all that we do, and that social interaction. Small-sided games are a great opportunity for this. So all this aligns and supports what we're doing, and that's really exciting. So let's get to it. Uh, it it was just, it really is a great reflection for me. I remember as a first-year teacher coming out and not really knowing anything about small-sided games and being a college softball player and a coach, you know, I found very quickly that the hardest unit for me to teach was the softball unit because I just had a, a different mindset and I was like, okay, nine on nine, you know, or 10 on 10, this is how we do it. But the kids, there was a lot of standing around the skill development was different, all their skill levels were different, and going too quickly in that larger context just did not work for my middle school kids. And so I really had to start researching how to make things better and how to get the skill development in better, and I just wasn't taught that right away. And so I really started to work on this multi-sided game thing and, and research things and work with other teachers and prof attend professional development things and just being able to dial down our activities to 
provide better progressions is what these small-sided games are all about. We want to break down the larger game context into smaller teams, smaller spaces. We want to um, set up and practice specific game situations. We want them to practice and select a tactic. You could even go two on two, one versus one with whatever it is that you're doing. So it depends upon your grade level. You know, elementary school, you can go smaller than what's on the screen right now, and then you can build into it. And in high school, you can go into those really larger game contexts. And I just want to show these visuals so that we can wrap, wrap our minds around that. How are we going to recreate the physical or tactical demands found in gameplay, but in smaller settings? And in the, at the same time, we're still going to be improving their fitness levels. And so thankfully, you know, times have changed and so have I, and I've learned how to implement the small sided games into my program and have progressions, and I'm excited to share that today. So the big picture, the big pull-up, bullet points here for why and what it provides is, is it increases the overall success rate. When you think about it, these kids, what they're doing, they need the experience. They need to get the touch on the ball. They need to be involved. And then it helps them perceive that they're doing better. And then they really are doing better. And a great quote, that first one there, is perceived competence sustains participation is really true. The research is showing that, you know, if they're really feeling successful, they're going to want to continue to do that activity. The participation, we really want to, in physical education, maximize our space and time. We want everyone to be as active as possible. We want them achieving their moderate to vigorous physical activity or MVPA level, and these small-sided game contexts help with that. The skill acquisition, same thing. The more opportunities I get to be involved, my skills are going to be improved. And then that tactical and that game sense. The application of strategy, the trial and error and learning from your experiences, it, it increases it all, and that's what it's all about. Also, we want to improve our inclusion. Everyone deserves an opportunity to participate, and being able to have small-sided gameplay in my classroom helps make sure everyone can be included and be successful. Next, assessment and feedback. I can provide feedback and more often, and it's more accurate. And so that's why I really appreciate the small-sided game context. And I can assess more accurately or be more specific with students and what they can improve in. And then progressions. I'm going to talk a lot about progressions, bringing students along step-by-step step so that they are successful. And then lastly, fitness. Yes, um, there's research out there. I've um, earmarked some stuff at the end here that you can look at it is small-sided gameplay. It depends on how you, you know, design it and what your goal is. It can also improve those student fitness levels. It's keeping them active. So it's really excited to share with everyone. Going into the importance of progression right away, because that helps you wrap your mind around the small-sided game context, is really students are better off to learn, like, the energy and the skills and the tactical application in those smaller group settings first. And then after this, you can build in that position work, the advanced strategies, and how to compete and win as a team. So really, before we give them this, this big picture, like I talked about earlier with the softball example, you know, before we give them this or make them do this, we need to give them this or let them have this, these small-sided game context, so that the perceived comp competence will sustain participation. That's that quote I got from a NASB workshop years ago, and it really has stuck in my mind. And another way to think about it is proper progressions will sustain their participation as well and will help them feel successful. An exciting thing I found here, um, someone was really short and sweet in how they said it was four main things that students want in games. And, and you know, they want to play games and they want to they be in the action. And those four things really rang, tr rang true with me and I wanted to share them with everyone today. They want action, they want involvement, they want excitement, and they want friendship. You know, this is a great recap of what physical education is about. And it, putting this larger games, breaking them down into smaller contexts, will provide this for the students, and that helps encourage their participation, increase their motivation, and it's really exciting to see it be successful in programs. My first example that I wanted to go over today is a game that's been really successful in our program, and we just call it cone ball. And it really is just similar to ultimate frisbee or handball. 
but everyone has a cone usually as a physical educator and a ball, and that's what we use. So keeping it really simple, this year there's pictures here of us on the tennis courts. We were out of a, out of a gym for over a year, and so we had to use the space outside even during poor weather, and I have three different pictures there of cones set up on our tennis courts, and we were able to, depending on whatever class size it was, provide a variety of small-sided games called cone ball. And it's ultimate frisbee style rules. They're using passing only to move the ball and they're trying to knock over the opponent's cone. It's two points if they knock over the cone, one point if they just hit the cone. And there's really no need for a goalie. You're playing three on three. If you wanted to have a goalie, you could and then they stood, stood you know, away from the cone. They can't stand on it. And then we add lots of layers and builds or progressions, you can call them, and modifications to help everyone be successful and to increase their skill development as they go. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in these next slides. You can also have rules of three. I didn't want to forget those, you know, three seconds to pass, you have to stand three feet away. You can only take, you know, a maximum of three steps depending upon the level of um, eight students that you have. So cone ball is one of the first ones that we teach our students. And then here they are, three on three cone ball in our gym setting. So when we were able to come back into our gymnasium this spring, we brought out cone ball again so the students could see it in the gym setting. And then the top left-hand picture there, I was super excited about this product coming out. It gives them a different angle, a different view of just instead of just a cone, they're knocking over something else, and it's the stir tee where this beach ball is propped up on it, and the kids loved it. What's neat about the bottom picture there is, um, it goes with that image in the middle, is we actually set up several sets of small-sided games, and even on three floors, we have three floors there, and the students do a wonderful job of staying in a safe space, we emphasize safe space, and if the ball goes into another game, they go around and they go get it, they're looking out for one another, and they get lots of repetition. There's no sitting out, everyone's moving, we're working on finding an open space, communicating with one another, um, making different shots, how to guard people. It's really a great context, and the kids love the game. So, the crazy cone ball series progression. First off, we do the three-on-three -three small sided games, as I've shown everyone here. And we add in those different rules. You know, we can add a, allow a bounce, not allow a bounce, how many seconds to pass or how many feet away. I only let one student guard the student with the ball. They have to have their arms up and out. Um, you can restart play after each score or attempt of scoring, or it can be continuous. There's a lot of different layers there. But as we move on from, from three on three and as the students begin to understand and develop their skills, then in the middle level, we can move on to two team games. So now we only have two teams, maybe they're a little bigger now. For example, here's a seven position um, team here. Some people may have played this, the handball style rules. You use the basketball key if you're inside as their goalie box. Your, mid, your mids can play and run both sides of the floor. You have two defense that can stay back with your goalie and two forwards that can play on the other half of the court. And so now they're learning the position work and they're bringing the skills along with them that they've learned from the small-sided games. You know, how to find an open space, how to guard people, how to take shots. Um, it's really successful and depending upon your space, maybe you can even split your courts in half certain ways so that you can have those two team games going. That's a little different from the three-on-three -three context. So here we are with progression, here we are with layers. The students are being successful, they're all still involved. And then it gets a little crazier with the four corner style games. Four corner games are always really fun to play. And again, though, having those progressions, having those layers really helps. And so we developed a four corner crazy cone ball now that really got all the students involved. We start with the jump ball in the middle. I will use two to three foam balls. I use a soft foam ball um, that this makes it easy for the students to catch and be able to throw. And then the red team, for example, on that diagram there, their goal would be to score on any of the other team's cones. 
And you can have different variations where uh, you can keep score with bean bags, kind of like a steal the bacon thing. If they red team scores on the green cone, then they get to take a bean bag from a pile back there and take it over to their their side. I like using wristbands. The goalies will wear wristbands. If someone scores on them, they will give a wristband to that team, and those kids will wear the wristband, so it's easier to keep score. When we first started, we didn't even keep score. The students just had fun, you know, um, trying to score on the other teams. You could also just say the first team to score on each of the other three goals wins. And so it's really interesting to see in these progressions how um, when you get to this point, sometimes teams will form alliances. Sometimes they'll have different strategies that they come up with, and it helps them interact with one another. It helps them try out different strategies but you've taken it from a small-sided game progression and you've built it into something else. And we use those same rules as the earlier cone ball versions, and they were always modifying depending upon what grade level we have and skill level of the students. Modifications and differentiation. So this is what really helps really enhance those small-sided games. You've got to unleash that creativity. And before I start the bullet points there is, if you look at that physio ball, it's um, supposed to be on an upside down frisbee, so that's the visual for you there. And the reason why I show that is because we were just using cones and we called it cone ball, but then, you know, after a while the students are like, hey, what else you got? What else, what else can we use as a target? And they, you gotta change it up on them and you have to be creative. And so we had physio balls and we had, we're like, well, they can hit that, it's a larger target and we decided to put it on an upside down frisbee, and then that held there, and then if they hit the ball or knocked it off of the frisbee, that would count as a point. So you can be creative with any of the equipment that you have. When it comes to the beginning level of play, I really like starting with a new jump ball after each time you score, or allowing a reset of the game and the team that didn't score, they get to start with the ball. And another great one is after any attempt to score a goal, regardless of the outcome, the other team gets possession. And that just helps with as the ball scrambles out of bounds or scrambles somewhere, they're not running after it and running into other people. They just know it's uh, regardless of whether that person made the shot or not, it's the other team's possession. And you can also allow one to two bounces on the pass so that they're, they're catching the ball and actually it instantly hits out of their hands. They can recover it or their teammates might be smart in, you know, using that bounce pass depending upon the game you're playing, have you taught them a bounce pass versus just an overhand pass. Some more advanced options for your differentiation are you can allow the continuous play so that they're hustling after their shots, they can rebound a shot, they can continue play, um, they can, after a score, they can, the goalie throws it in after setting up the cone. Um, or whatever the target is, and then you can take away that bounce pass. So there's some beginning and advanced level ideas. For any level, if you start to get into some bigger teams when you have those smaller sided game situations, the three on three, I, you know, I let my kids play sometimes three on four, and then we talk about what was it like to play three on four? What was it like for that other team to have that extra person so that then no one's sitting out? And then it's a good talking, talking or strategy session for the team to learn. And then some, for example, in basketball, you could say whoever takes the shot rotates out and there's a constant rotation for however many seconds. Another one, the last point there is, I really wanted to emphasize, depending upon your space and the amount of equipment you have, I really encourage people and teachers to think of play half court games. Anything you have, whether it's a yard game like horseshoes or cone ball like I've been talking about, Break the games in half, and instead of having clothes on each end, it's half court. So now I'm throwing a horseshoe at the horseshoe pit. I run down, I pick it up, and I run back. You know, I'm playing half court. Cone ball, same thing. Um, just like in half court basketball, they have to return that ball outside of that three-point line before they can go back in and score. So there again, you can have some smaller-sided context and depending upon if your equipment is limited, you can use the half court style as well to enhance the small sided game. Just some more ideas here is allowing the more or less bounces on the path, the, the steps as well, while in possession after a catch. You can always add or remove players, add or remove positions, 
play no out of bounds. If you're inside, we've allowed the ball. If it actually hits off the wall, if they catch it off the wall, that's fine. You know, it depends upon what's safe for you, how the environment works for you. Um, the jumping jack guarding, I like to call it, is the arms are always up and out. You're that arm length away or the three feet away. Another one we've done is after small-sided progressions and just being able to mix it up for the kids as they choose their level of competition. So we've done a lot of mixed abilities, a lot of mixed skills or developing their skills, and now maybe there's a lesson there where we allow them to choose. Are they more of a challenge or competitive? They're those super competitive kids, and they don't have to be the best skilled. It's just their choice of, of competition. So I think we really emphasize that difference if we're doing that. And then there's recreation, like they're – you know, a little less competitive, but they're still playing, they're still working hard, and it's amazing to see their, the kids when they're allowed to choose what level of competition they want, how they get even more into it. And so we really like to mix it up so it's not always one way or the other. We're providing a variety, and again, that autonomy and that choice that they have in their environment really helps as well. Some favorites that I really love are is that you cannot attempt to score twice in a row. So this one really helps share the ball in the game. The same person cannot attempt to score over and over and over again. They have to now start thinking about, okay, who can I get it to? How can I set my team up for success? Because I can't attempt to score twice in a row. You could require a sequence of passes. Everyone must, must touch the ball before trying to score. You can require a certain number of passes before taking a shot, and you could have them have to count those out loud even if needed, and then they take the shot. And another one of my favorites is if you score, then you go exchange places with your goalie. And then this way you don't have the same person at the goalie position if you have a goalie, you know, if it's a little bigger context. They're not there the whole time whether they want to be or not, and it allows for everyone to be involved and to share the support and responsibility. So those are some really great modifications and progressions to think about. And another one is that I get questions on a lot is, well, my space, my space is really small or I have really large class sizes. And so here are some suggestions for when that happens. I have used the live sideline where the students have to side shuffle to where wherever the ball is at, and they're that live sideline. So they're side shuffling, it can be jogging in place when they're waiting, if the ball hasn't left that part of the court. What helps with this is I have my pedometer goals. So they have activity time goals. They can still be active. They can be watching the game. And then if the team gets stuck, they can use a pass to the sideline to have help. And then the sideline can catch it, and they have to pass that back to that team that had possession of the ball. So it lets everyone stay involved. Another idea is you could have a strategy session sideline. So if you're really emphasizing different tactics and strategies and reflections, a team could rotate out, be watching others. They could be watching their own gameplay if it was being recorded and you were using some sort of video delay app, and they could watch that session. They could analyze it, and then before they return on their rotation, they have to let the teacher know, hey, what's one strategy, a new strategy we're going to apply um, apply or try when we go back into our game context. So that strategy session is great reflection for the team. Some other ideas are fitness center sidelines. So maybe you have a setup there, you have three smaller sided games going, maybe two, whatever it is, but on your baselines or some other area, again, this can be done inside or outside, which really makes it excellent. You can bring out the fitness center aspect stuff, some jump ropes, body weight exercises, floor spots, exercise spots, fit deck cards. There's so many different ideas. And they can just rotate through those on their own, 10 of each, five of each, whatever it is. And then when it's their turn to go into the um, gameplay, whatever rotation you have, they've been still doing something that's purposeful. They've been working on their fitness. Health Center is another one. There's the Scholastics nutrition cards. There's nutrition my plate games. There's content questions that you could have that they could be reviewing different activities that are short, quick, that you can have on the baseline. Self-reflection journal time, maybe a self-assessment rubric, how, how am I doing with my throwing, finding an open space, whatever it is. And again, the strategy session stuff is really wonderful for a peer check peer check rubric, you know, maybe they're watching somebody and then giving them feedback. So 
So that's another way to utilize maybe those larger class sizes and you want to still be able to have the small sided game context. Assessments, feedback, and pedometer use. So all of this helps with using that FitStep Pro pedometer, some piece of feedback to where the students know how they're doing, the teacher knows how they're doing. Am I talking too much and my students didn't have enough lesson time today? Well, my pedometer tells me that because it takes activity time and it takes NBPA time. And so I really do encourage daily pedometer use, downloading that data so that you can analyze it, you can know how you're doing as a teacher, how are your lessons doing, are they as active as you like, when they're supposed to be, you know, having that certain level of NBPA. It's not every lesson's different, you know, we can't have that same level of NBPA all the time, but when we want them being active, hey, this is a great way to have that feedback. Setting achievable goals, though, is really important. We don't want to burn these kids out. We want to set them up for success, and so learning how to set those achievable goals, maybe starting small, seeing how that works, and then building for there so that they're not discouraged and that so that they can achieve them and that what matches, it matches what the effort they're putting into it, the results they're getting, the expectations that their teacher has, and the student feels successful and wants to continue. The pedometers, they allow for self-assessment as well. I have my students set personal goals. They try and meet or beat it. They reflect on that goal. It's a nice challenge. There'll be days where I'll wear the pedometer and this might be in fitness stations too, where they have to try and meet or beat the number of the amount of activity time or NBPA that I get, you know, and they usually do because I'm in there not only being active, but I'm also in there helping the students. So I might have to stop, talk with someone, and, you know, it gives them the opportunity to meet or beat my numbers. Interactivity challenges I think are really fun too. You might award points not just for scoring, so it's not just about skill level, but maybe teams can earn points for the amount of NDPA that they've accumulated or being able to answer content questions. So here's some ideas on how to provide that assessment, the feedback, and utilize pedometers in your game situations. I think it's fun to talk about target and goal variations. Again, mixing it up for kids. So you could have all different sizes of cones. If you were doing four corner cone ball, you could have a different size cone at each corner. Make each team top take a turn guarding the different sizes and then ask them to reflect on, on that. What was it like? What, what was it easier or harder guarding which side of cone, which size of cone? Which did you prefer? How did you embrace that challenge? What did you do? There's the stir tee, the physio ball, and the upside down frisbee. And then another great one I learned here was the tripod of cones and an omnicon stick style ball, those lighter balls on the tripod of cones. And you can set down four spots there on the ground around the, the goal to make it a lacrosse style goal. And you can score from any direction. If you have a lot of great space, if you're outside on the grass, that makes it really fun as well. Some more ideas is students can actually hold the hoop and for an object to go through, like there's the on the can fix ball there. And now it's more of a cooperative thing. They're actually trying to score on their goalie's hoop. So the goalie's there, they have to stay in their goalie box area, but they can move around to try and catch the ball through the hoop um, for that goal. They have some great indoor-outdoor. We have these disc target sets, and so we can use these for small-sided frisbee, Lots of different activity ideas here and different heights, and it helps mix things up. We also have disc, disc catchers with our disc golf set. And then I love the hoop holders. You know, that's a really simple way to throw those in, and you could even play, like, disc golf on scooters if you'd like inside. If you get rained out, we get rained out when we're playing disc golf, and so we'll bring it in and have our hoop holders, and we'll throw our discs through there, and we have some foam indoor discs. So there's a lot of fun ideas. With the TPSR teaching personal and social responsibility, I do post the code of conduct so I can re refer my kids to that in a conversation. Are you respecting the rules? Is that, are you maintaining your self-control? And that's really helpful inside the game context. So I just wanted to share that with you. Also, I really wanted to emphasize the power of debriefing. And I love this quote, too often we give children the answers to remember rather than problems to solve. And this is all about problem solving. And so having that strategy session time, being able to um, a talk with your team and then as the teacher say, what's the one strategy you came up with? Or what did you reflect upon? It's really important for them. 
you know, so a strong lesson debrief or lesson closure and the teaching games for understanding and the game sense stuff is really helpful in all of this and you can apply this and meld them together. But I didn't want to, um, I wanted to really emphasize small-sided games in general and then I have a lot of resources for you at the end that are about the TGFU and the game sense. You know, how are we going to teach our students to read, respond, react? and then recover within gameplay. And so I really liked that um, picture there, and I'll show it one more time here. And I found this through social media, you gotta love that. And I have that reference there, and there, he has a great website. So another one here, and it's referenced is for the TGFU model. And I just wanted to show that picture. It's a great thing for people to look into and how they're utilizing it the game appreciation, the tactics, how are they making decisions, executing the skill, and it's a cycle where you're asking the students to reflect and they're getting better and better and better at their gameplay. So it's an excellent thing to integrate in. I wanted to show you not just Coneball, but some other aspects of invasion games, other games that we play. And so we do soccer, lacrosse, rugby, flag football, and ultimate, and we always start with our small-sided gameplay first. And this is some great pictures from the academy soccer coach thing. And what was neat here is that with his year-long study, the benefits of four and four games versus the eight on eight in terms of the measurable data, look at those percentages there. How many more, per, how, 135 percent more passes, so many more attempts on the goal, more one-on-one -on -one account, encounters. Just the percentages are really positive there in helping the students get better. And this gentleman had, or this resource had, all these different types of games, and you can adapt to any game, not just soccer, to the games that you play and utilize these small-sided games. So there will be some neat pictures for you to refer back to in the resources. Ultimate Frisbee, I talked a little bit about it earlier. You can break that down as a small-sided game and you can use the disc golf catchers as a target versus an end zone, you can, you can do both. Another excellent game that I love, especially as a lead up, is the box style ultimate frisbee game. And you have cones in a grid and you have more cones inside of it. And so you have a square set up within a square and that smaller square is your goal. So it's kind of an inside out game where they are, they have to stay within the big square and they have to try and catch it in that goal box. And it's kind of like the key where three seconds in the key, you can't be standing and camping out in that center box the whole time to catch the frisbee. You have to try and get in, get your pass. If you don't get it, you have to go back out. And so it really is very small sided. You can have a lot of them set up on a field and it really is great for them. It can be a make it, take it. So once I score, I now have to pass it outside to my teammates and we have to go outside of the cones, the larger cones before we can go back in. And that makes it challenging in and of itself because the, goal, the Frisbee might be intercepted or knocked down during that time. Volleyball. Volleyball's really been turned upside down in a positive way for us with the smaller sided gameplay. We used to have large nets and we did traditional teams, and that's what we did. Well, we have middle school kids. The ball dropped a lot, and now there's a lot of great games where you can allow the bounce. Um, you can play with different types of volleyballs. We use the lighter ones. We've setting, we're setting them up for success, but that was then, and what we realized was is on our basketball court, we had the net going all the way across with the pickleball net, and then our badminton net, and so I say, said, hey, why not leave them there on the standard and put our badminton nets at volleyball height. And so now we have four small volleyball courts going all the way across, and they love it. Now this group is six on six, but we usually have four on four. You can have the different progressions, and it's just wonderful. The ball drops a lot less. The kids are able to apply their skills a lot better, and I can fit more students in an area and they're more successful and they still have plenty of room. I mean, I have middle school kids, so this might be a little different in a high school context, but for small sided games and lead up, it's a great idea to consider. So when I'm using my two side courts for volleyball, I could really use one now and still have the same amount of students going. So I really encourage people to think about that and to 
regimes that traditional. Same thing with soccer and cricket. There's a great game. It's also called Wamba Ball. Is um, now with this picture, the kids would be more spread out, obviously, but just a great little example picture here is you can play a cricket style softball game, you can play a cricket style game, and everyone's getting in and they're playing some sort of aspect of the larger group game. And that was one of my frustrations with softball when I originally started teaching it is you have that one person batting and everyone else standing around. Well, for our skill development and getting, we weren't there yet. And so this would be a great lead up game, a great small sided game to build into that. Just to recap here is hopefully you've really understood that the small sided games really do improve the overall success rate of your students. They're going to get more touches on the ball. They're going to increase their skills and it's going to maximize participation. In the picture above, I have all of my students playing. I have all my adapted and um, students in there as well, and all of them have a part on their team and they're all involved. It's really wonderful. Their skills are also, you know, increasing, and they're per we're promoting the tactical and the strategic application, and they're being able to talk as a team and try out different strategies. Increasing level of inclusion, I've already mentioned that and I'm able to walk around, pop in, talk with kids, provide specific feedback. You know, I'm able to assess our, how are they doing, are they being involved. It's really exciting. And the progressions really are key here in the recap is those progressions to bring everyone along, you know, that perceived competence, sustained participation. And fitness levels are being improved. Everyone's being active, everyone's going. It's really exciting. Here are several slides of resources. Like I said, I'm giving you all my favorite hits here. Here's, here's a lot of different ways, blogs, resource pages, papers, um, games. It's all here. It will be on the website for you that you see there, the PE Champs. And again, Champs is Creating Healthy Active Minds for Personal Success. That's our program here at Moscow Middle School. Our kids are champions of you know, their fitness, their health, their lifelong activity, and we're really excited about what we're doing. I have my own progressions handout that I use for my sessions. There's Wamba Ball, Ball, Bonker Ball, Disc Lacrosse, and then, of course, um, there's all the papers there. So it's really exciting. That last um, picture there on the right couldn't be, you know, more true. It's the most valuable resource that all teachers have is each other. So without collaboration, our growth is limited to our own perspectives. And so I really thank everyone for being here today. This, all I've learned from others before me, you take it, you build upon it, you make it work for your students so that they can all be successful. So I really thank you for watching today, and I encourage you to contact me anytime. I encourage you to get involved in the social media professional network that's out there, Voxer, Twitter, Facebook, all those things. There's great people out there sharing ideas. And I really want to thank you for your time today. Well, thanks, Jessica. And a reminder, we do have time for questions. So you can enter your questions on the right-hand side of your screen. Again, I'm the only one, the moderator, who can see those questions. We'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, so feel free to ask any questions you might have there. Um, a couple of things that we did have questions on early on. Um, you will receive a certificate of participation emailed um, to the email address that you used to register. Also, a number of people wondering if the slides will be available. We'll also email out a link to the slides. Um, a couple of questions for you, Jessica. Um, how much time do you spend? You mentioned the debrief for the lesson closure. Um, how do you do that? How much time do you spend on that um, to maximize? I know maximizing physical activity is a big part of um, PE classes right now. How do you do that? Well, it's definitely a learning experience for me. I think it depends on the class and uh, the length of my day. My class periods are 49 minutes in length on some days, and then they're 72 minutes in length on other days. And so those 72 minute days, we do half of it is fitness training. So today we are doing different circuits, agility circuits, working our skill-related fitness and our health-related fitness. And then the second part of class would be their um, other activity, pickleball or dance or the um, other games that we're doing. So depending upon how much time I have, um, I will take those strategy session breaks throughout the gameplay to give them that time out because I don't want the kids to tuck out too. If you let the, the games go for too long, then they get tired anyways and they're not giving their best. And so, 
you know, keeping rounds of games to like three or four minutes in the smaller sided context and giving them a quick break to be able to talk some strategy, I think is a really good starting point. And then at the end, the wrap up, bring them in for the two to three minutes if you wanted them to be stretching at the same time, if you were concerned about losing activity time, if you wanted them to be, um, I mean, there's a variety of ways, but you really have to play with it. I'm not advocating for a five to 10 minute lesson closure, but I think it's really critical that we spend a few minutes checking in with our kids. How was our activity time today? You know, what was it like compared to the day before? What made your team successful? What's one, I'll, I'll pull from each team so that no one, you know, gets out of it is I'll say, I need each team to give me one thing that helped them be successful today or what's one thing that overall that they found in the game as a successful strategy. Or if one team shares one thing, I'll say, okay, let's build upon that. You know, red team, what can you take from that and build upon that? And so, um, I encourage everyone to be active and to also take that time at the end. But there's obviously those days where I'll, I'm like, oh, I lost track of time. We got it. We got it. We got to get in there and get changed. We might only have one or two little sharing tidbits there. So um, just a few minutes, really. And if we need more, we need more, depending upon that class. Good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and just a general question, how many students do you typically have in your classes? On average, about 30. We okay. up to 36 is the really large ones that are the challenging 40, um, but they've done a little better this uh, last year for us. So uh, 36 has been my biggest, 30 is my average. Okay. And then can you touch again on um, like the lead up and the skill development, um, you know, leading up to the gameplay? And how do you do that? Do you use the, you know, the similar structure of the small sided games or how do you do that? Exactly, yeah. I use a similar structure of the small sided game. So in volleyball or softball, we're taking one critical element and we're practicing that context. So within a volleyball game, for example, if I have four on four, it's going to be we've worked on our passing. So we've worked on our passing. Now it's going to be this game for the next few minutes is passing only. You can start with a little serve or toss it over, but it's passing only. You can say maybe as many hits as you need to get the ball over depending upon your, you know, your level. Or I've said, you know, you have to have at least two hits before you send it over the net. So you're really, and that's the game, you know, you're really making them work on, okay, passing only two passes before you send it over the net. So if you don't, then it's a point for the other team. And then that way the games aren't just, they bump it back and forth with one hit only. Um, for those small-sided games, we're focusing on that particular skill, and then we'll add another one in. Okay, so now you have to have at least two passes and a set or something, you know, no spiking yet. We have, they always want to get, I just want to spike, I just want to spike. Well, you don't know how to spike yet. We're going to practice spiking, but right. we want to get, the, the pass is the foundation, you have to have a good pass, have to have a good serve, you know, so we, we dial them back and then we do practice the spikes, we do practice the setting, but being on those smaller nets and those smaller courts, I can get everyone the repetitions that they need within the drills and those small sided games. So um, that's what's really exciting about, you can pick a skill or a strategy to emphasize and emphasize that, make that the requirement for that part of the game and then build it into something else or maybe you have you know, multiple rules that you're working on. Um, you just have to continue to find a way to play with, you know, how much is too much and how much is not enough. And there, there's a different formula for everyone, but that's how I um, do that myself. So yeah. um, I hope that helps with that one. And then do you, um, do you do skill assessment as you're moving throughout the, the class? And I guess a, a general related question to that is, um, any any classroom management suggestions for you know moving through the class? You, if you have you know six games going on at the same time, um, you know how do you spread your time amongst those areas? And then I guess what do you uh, what do you, what are you looking for? I imagine it's different on different days. Yes, absolutely. Um, so for the skill skill assessment one and looking for that. If I'm looking for opposition in the throwing or if the strategy-wise finding open space, what's nice about the small-sided games is I can really look for that specific thing and the student has more opportunities to actually demonstrate that. 
Now they're not, if they're not in my program, they're not being graded against that, you know, in that context, whether they're, um, you know, for their points for that day. But that's what I'm looking for. I might say, we're, here's, we practice our throwing, we warmed up with our throwing, now we're going to use our throwing in this context or passing, whatever it is. And so I can give them that feedback in that, that game situation. Are they able to apply it in some um, brief feedback or more of the strategy stuff in those situations? And that's what I like about the skill stuff. If I'm looking at their skills or their strategies, I can actually see it happening versus in the larger game context when it was 11 on 11 or 10 on 10 for softball, I didn't get to see everyone bat all the time every class grade. I didn't get to see everybody, you know, throw or run or whatever it was. And so the small-sided games helped me be able to see from our warm-ups or our skill, you know, uh, drills or whatever in the – the games, are they being able to apply it and how is it going in the applica application setting? And then the management, the classroom management is, I have to space them out enough. I have to, you know, my back is not to the students as much as possible so I can always keep students in view. And I really try and emphasize safety with them and being in control. And if they're not in control, I'm pulling them. I'm, you just start to develop that, where can I stand? and how do I move through and who am I checking in with. And so that, that is a big emphasis for me is that management piece and then it helps keep the rest of it successful. That's why I really like that sport ed code of conduct, hanging it up on the wall. If I'm having issues with some students, I can have them check in with me. I can pull them aside and say, hey, how's it going today? What do you think we're, we're needing to improve in with our code of conduct? Are you maintaining your self-control? Are you, um, you know, respecting the rules and the calls? And so that's that quick check-in, and then I can move on to another group. But it's no different than a large group setting. You know, you have to check in with different kids. You're watching the kids in the big picture, and you're moving around with them. And so the classroom management is definitely um, uh, it's an interesting piece, and it's a good piece. I like the smaller-sided game situation so I can move throughout them, and um, you just get better and better as the day goes as to how much time to spend and where and who have you checked in with and, and what, are, what are you working on for the day. So kind of planning that out really helps. Okay, good. Um, question about um, kind of the, the def definition and the effectiveness of, of the size of, of small-sided games. Um, what's your thought on, on the number of kids um, per team um, that would fall within the de definition of a small-sided game? If somebody had you know, 70 students or somebody has 30 students, um, you know, with 30 students, are you looking at, you know, dividing it up, so you have six different teams, 70 students, you know, should it be you know, 12 teams? What are your thoughts with folks who maybe have some really big classes but also have a bigger space? What would you say is a good number for the team size on small-sided games? Oh, that's a hard question because everyone is so different. So I think doing the best you can at maximizing your space and your equipment that's available, you know, I think that's, that's the hard part. And I know in one of the resources that I have for folks is um, the soccer profession. They've, they're so great with, they've had so much information on the small-sided gameplay, and there's a graph in one of them. If any of those people want that, I can refer them to that. But they actually have a breakdown of, like, age groups and small-sided games and 4v4, you know, utilizing it with, six and eight year olds, nine and 10 year olds, 11 and 12 year olds, and then it moves up to five versus five, and then seven versus seven is more for nine and 10, 11, 12, and, and older nine on nine is more for middle school and older. And so there's this neat graph that you can see, and I've known people who do with lead up kind of activities, two on two, one on one, just for some skill development and whatnot. So that's a little more difficult for me to answer is it depends mm -hmm. on what their goal for the day too. Are they going to do sure. when I have those really large classes and it, it sounds like it might maybe only be half the size of someone else's class and that's unfortunate for that student to teacher ratio in those school districts. You know, we're trying to advocate for that and at our national level to make those changes. But when that's what you have, you know, are you going to do half of it fitness, half of it the small sided gameplay? Right. And then how big is that space? So for me, what I'm doing is I have three-on-three, four-on-four, who might work up to five-on-five, six-on-six, 
depending on the sport or the activity, and also it depends upon my time for the day, the um, equipment that I have, and the number of kids. So I think there's different formulas you can try, and that's what we've done. We have just we have tried different things and found something that works for us, and we're always changing and we're always going. So you know, uh, I'm I'm sorry I cannot answer that a little no, right. more for them. I hope that helps. I think. That's what's interesting about small-sided games is there's a lot of different definitions of that as well. And then you have TGFU, the Teaching Games for Understanding. You have Game Sense. There's all that kind of mixed in there. And so I really wanted to keep this to small-sided games on three and three, four and four, or five on five, depending upon what that larger context looks like. So, so what does the larger game look like? Try and break that down as best you can and then have progressions from there. Good. Well, thank you, Jessica, for taking time out of your day. I know you've got a class yeah. to teach here, so we'll let you get going. Before um, I announce the winner of our Softex Rainbow set of soccer balls and our Class Plus disc pack, I wanted to remind everybody that our next webinar will be next month. Um, keep an eye out in your email for what the topic will be. Um, your certificate of participation and the will should be on its way shortly, and the announcement of our next webinar uh, will be on its way shortly too. Um, the winner is Ed Wellen of California. He's a PE teacher at the Gillespie School, and he has won a $430 equipment pack that includes a set of six Softex rainbow soccer balls and our Class Plus disc packs. Again, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and we hope that you can join us again for a future webinar. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, everybody.